is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for Super Bowl 56, our first look at the Rams versus the Bengals. We'll be talking to Edward Egros of More Ways to Win, getting his read on the Rams offense, the Bengals offense, the traditional markets, and some fun props, as always. Edward will dig up. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com. Joined here as always by Dr. Ed Fang. You can find his work over at thepowerrank.com. Ed, two more really fun games this past weekend. We had the Bengals winning in overtime. Big comeback there. Rams had a big comeback of their own. We got to see the full Jimmy Garoppolo experience on display. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. We're getting dumped on with snow, so we're expecting <laughs> over a foot here. My kids are home on a snow day already. It's piling up. I, I expect that maybe the snowstorm will reach you guys it will. in tonight. a couple of days. You guys right? Probably by the weekend, right? We get rain tonight, which transitions to freezing yeah. rain and then becomes snow. We're supposed to go to an Airbnb on Friday. It's like, a, hey, we started to survive football season thing. And uh, we're probably still going to be able to go, but like we have to delay it to, to Saturday if things are, if can, things turn out the way they look so far. Can you, have you survived football season Close without enough. getting through the Super Bowl? Close enough. Super Bowl, yeah, Super Bowl is just, just fun. Like I have, yeah, for sure. I have the podcast with, with you next week. We'll talk about that right. in a second. Uh, I have a one DFS podcast, but like when I'm researching for one game, it's very fast. Like we know these For teams. Sure. I don't need yeah, to exactly. too much. Like it's yeah. kind of nice. I kind of wish every week were one game. That's what I'm saying here. Yeah, but our income would be a lot smaller if every game were one week. So. Accurate. I retract my statement. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a bummer. Yeah, I thought we saw some pretty incredible games. Uh, I think uh, Kansas City had kind of an epic collapse. Um, you know, it was interesting. They did have about a 56% passing success rate over the course of the game, it just seemed, I didn't actually go back and, and do the exact calculation, but it seemed very lopsided between the first yeah. half and the second half. I mean, they were essentially unstoppable until the fourth down on their fourth drive um, when they got stoned and, and let the clock run out and, and not go up 28, uh, 28, 10, I guess that would have been right before the half, but yeah. So that was kind of disappointing when you, when you had, Casey minus seven there. So that was uh that was a bummer. Something that looked uh almost certain uh heading down to that last drive in the first half and then and then didn't quite work out. And then um, you know, I thought the the Rams game was kind of interesting. It, it kind of played out how I thought. I think the Rams were gonna win that game because they had the better passing offense. And uh I think a lot of that same logic uh, I'll be talking about later when we when we look at the Super Bowl. Yeah, and that second game, it was basically Jimmy Garoppolo constantly trying to give the Rams the lead, trying to give them, you mm -hmm. know, the football. And just like the Rams kept dropping it. But like regression happens. Um, it doesn't yeah. always happen in games. Sometimes like, you know, you, your pick report shows that you don't always see regression occur, even across a full 16 game or 17 game season. Yeah. But it happened on that last drive. We saw yeah. the ball finally go into the hands of a guy who was right there. And like, it just seemed like it was inevitable, like it was going to happen. And eventually mm -hmm. it did because he just right. kept putting himself in bad situations. Right. Exactly. And, um, you know, I think we saw that the, the Rams offense is pretty good and, and I, that, that tends to be the most predictable part of the NFL. Yeah, certainly. So we'll see. We're going to talk plenty about that game with uh, Edward E. Gross. He, of course, is a professor at SMU and at Pepperdine. We're going to talk to him today about his thoughts on Super Bowl 56, uh, get his rundown of the traditional markets, prop markets, and much more. Of course, you can find Edward on More Ways to Win, Valley Sports, NBC Sports Edge. He's everywhere, including here. We'll talk to him later on. But this is not our only show for Super Bowl 56. As you recall, last year we did a live show on, uh, I think it was Wednesday, Talking about props, doing a full hour-long in-depth prop show. We're doing that again this year live on the FanDuel YouTube page. Our only live show, I believe, the entire year. Uh, but live on the FanDuel YouTube page, 6 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. We have not cranked out all the guests yet, but J.J. Zacharyson of Late Round Fantasy. I, I can say that now. Um, <laughs> although he's no longer with FanDuel number five, he's still going to be on the show. So congrats to J.J. on the new venture. He will still be with us. Uh, he'll still be with us for a lot of different stuff. So so good to hear JJ's voice here talking some props next week. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, that is next week 
on the FanDuel YouTube page, 6 p.m. And it will go up on the podcast feed after that, too. So hit subscribe on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. Hit subscribe on the FanDuel YouTube page to get all those, to get you set for Super Bowl 56. We'll talk to Edward to get you set, uh, his thoughts on that first. But before we do that, got to go back to last week and recap the conference championships from a betting perspective. Covering the past. Last week, our guest here on the show was Cole Wright. You can find him on Twitter at Cole Wright. He, of course, is Edward's colleague on More Ways to Win. You can also find him on Marquee Sports Network. For Bengals versus Chiefs, Cole wanted the over. It was a 54 and a half when we talked, uh, and it did close there. He also had Joe Mixon over 57 and a half rushing yards, and the total didn't get there. Uh, they were at 48 at the end of regulation, finished with 51 points. Mixon did go over easily. He had 88 yards on 21 carries. So one and one for Cole in that game. On the NFC side, he had Matthew Stafford over 277 and a half passing yards. Another one that went over pretty easily. Stafford finished with 337. The script definitely helped getting behind, but uh, Cole said he thought that game would be competitive, and it was, and that factored into Stafford going over his number. So nice week by Cole, uh, going two and one. In the week uh, there, again, find him on Twitter at Cole Wright and check him out on More Ways to Win and Marquee Sports Network. My bet was on Brandon Ayuk, over 49 and a half receiving yards. Uh, this is another one that hit pretty early on. Uh, he had 56 yards in the first half. That led the team at that point. He finished with 69. Uh, that was second behind Debo Samuel, who had 72. So overall, a good week for the show in general. And Ed, uh, your numbers had Rams minus 2.9. That point one points, man. I'm pretty disappointed. You didn't quite. Uh, you couldn't quite yeah, get that you know. extra point one. You know, got to work a little harder next year. That's right. But uh, you know, I think that your numbers and you talking about it like verbally had a good read on the way that game went, and it just it just seemed like it was kind of the way we we could have thought things would go. Yeah, it it definitely went the the way I thought it would go in terms of the Rams finally being able to pull it out. I think a lot of the narrative was around that San Francisco to beat them twice. And Edward and I actually for seven nuggets Saturday, we dug up some work by Chase Stewart who had looked at, you know, I think the 22 times that a team had beaten another team twice in the regular season and 14 had actually won the third game. Mm -hmm. So I would actually really like to do that study with college basketball. Cause that's, yeah. that's more likely, um, you know, usually if you beat a team twice, you're the better team and that's why you're more likely to win the third time, especially if you're going to be at home in that, in that playoff game. That really wasn't the case here because San Francisco wasn't the better team and San Francisco had, you know, had the good fortune of, you know, having better passing numbers than the Rams in those previous two games. When I look at success rate, I didn't think that was going to happen again. It didn't happen again. And that ended up being the difference. Certainly. And, uh, and Cooper Rams... Cup is good. What's that? And Cooper Cup is good. A little bit. Just a little, a little bit, bit good. Very frustrating when you're not as high on him on DFS as you should have been, but uh, still very good. So uh, shocker right. to Cooper Cup excelling there. We're talking about Cooper Cup and more with Edward Egros. Find him on Twitter at Ed with Sports and check him out on More Ways to Win. We'll talk to Edward in just one second. But first, FanDuel now offering an exciting twist, the beloved Same Game Parlay. Now introducing the Same Game Parlay Plus, which allows you to combine Same Game Parlays across multiple games. All you have to do is head over to the FanDuel Sportsbook and navigate to the same game parlay tab of the first game you're interested in. Select multiple bets in the first game and then plus it up. Now you can add more bets from the other same game parlay labeled games. Head over to the FanDuel Sportsbook today and opt in to the same game parlay plus. Must be 21 plus and present Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Same game parlay plus available for all sports or for multiple sports in all states on mobile and web. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Visit FanDuel.com slash RG. In New York, call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Connecticut, call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. Uh, in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-979. In West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.NET. Or in Arizona, call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. Covering the present. Let's bring Edward E. Ross into covering the spread to take our first look at Super Bowl 56. Edward, we appreciate the time. How are you doing today? I am doing well. How is this your first look already? I mean, we, we've got two weeks to do this stuff. I mean, there's no pacing 
you got to, you know, get right into it and talk about, you know, third string offensive tackles here. Well, there were a couple other things in the news yesterday. I think that's a big part. Oh, of yeah, it. yeah. That. Yeah. yeah. That. Uh, yeah. Tuesday, slightly eventful uh, across the board. It's like, oh, we got to yeah. redo all of our sappy Tom Brady tributes. And then it's like, oh, wow, wow. This is a massive, massive, massive story across the entire NFL. Yeah. Jim Harbaugh like, is definitely a massive. Sure. Yeah. Story. That was exactly, exactly, yeah, exactly. Uh, what I was going for there. <laughs> Yeah. But like, you know, a couple of things distracting us here, Edward. So uh, I feel like we got to we got to catch up now at this point. You know what we need to do is we all need to collectively thank Adam Schefter and Jeff Darlington for breaking the news over the weekend. Because the, the truth of the matter is, had we found out on Tuesday concerning Tom Brady's retirement, it would have been right. clouded by what I would argue is more important news. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I don't think it's fair to Brady, to be honest. I mean, this is someone who's given his life to, <laughs> to the league for a very long time. And I feel like he deserves, you know, his just due respect. And he got that on Saturday, you know, but at least on Twitter and, you know, friends I've spoken to. Tuesday, it, it would have been clouded with other things. And you, you can't always help that, obviously, whenever you're making a, a big announcement like such. But... At least we were able to give him his space, which I think was important, so that on Tuesday we could focus on, again, more important issues. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think uh, I think Tom Brady is going to get his due over the course of uh, the rest of football history, so I'm not too concerned about it. Uh, <laughs> Unless perhaps, you're in New York. I mean, he did, he did get his due on, on Saturday. Yeah. You know? Yeah, so. I feel like that thing was kind of just a miscommunication because I know Adam Schefter in the past has spoken publicly about like sitting on John Elway's retirement news because Elway asked him to. Like he's mm -hmm. talked about that. And then people are like, oh, we should let people announce when they want to. I'm like, I'm pretty sure if Brady had asked me, he probably would have done that. Like Adam Schefter is a pretty like upstanding dude in that regard. Like he's talked about this before. So I'm pretty sure it was just a miscommunication in a situation where <laughs> miscommunications can be pretty high stakes unfortunately but like you know it happens it, it, it certainly can i think though at the same time when you have so many different ways to validate a story like that or confirm a story like that that at some point it's not just okay i'm gonna sit on this retirement news because i'm literally the only person who knows this i mean right. think think of the media landscape when john elway was retiring compared with today right so many more voices so many more people can come out and say something to where you really can't afford that to someone nearly as much as you could say 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, certainly. And it was also weird to like see people like question like, oh, Schefter's sources, because it's like you realize that he and Jeff Darlington were the guys who like first hinted Brady would leave, right? Mm -hmm. Like that that was a thing too. So uh it led to a lot of weird discourse uh throughout the weekend. But like you said, I'm glad that Tom Brady at least got a, a bit more time in the time in the sun before uh the wild uh, afternoon that was <laughs> tuesday Goodness. now we're talking about super bowl with you in just a second here edward but mm -hmm. i do want to go back and look at the playoffs first because it was a pretty interesting playoffs i thought in terms of uh the way things broke a lot of tight games and stuff like that uh, we saw different kinds of teams excel were there any specific takeaways you had from this year's playoffs that you want to make sure you keep in your mind when the playoffs roll around next year yeah, absolutely. And to answer that question, I think it's really important that we make a distinction that I don't feel like we discuss enough in terms of the difference between analytics and game theory. Analytics, you're taking in data, you're looking at data trends, you're trying to find something actionable, something that's forecastable. And that's great. Obviously, we all do that for a living and we get paid for it. Game theory, I think, is also really important in the grand scheme of things. It's who is able to adjust? You know, it's it's the prisoner's dilemma. It's all that stuff that we learned, uh, you know, in economics class and things like that. But it's it's game theory where you're talking about, okay, this is happening, so how are you going to adjust? And then how does the adjustee become the adjuster? All that fun stuff. And it's sort of the essence of the matchups that we see in football that I think we might talk about on an individual level, but I don't know if we discuss it enough on a coaching level. And I think we saw it in the conference championship games, uh, you know, in full overdrive. And I really think it's worth taking a step back and looking at what these coaches were able to do to stymie what had been good offenses up to that point for the most part. So when you look at the Rams defense, a team that was, you know, having the toughest time against the 49ers for one reason or another, what did they do in that game? A lot more single high safety than they had ever played all season. They loaded the box a good bit more than they ever needed to. 
And obviously you do that to stop the run and you force Jimmy Garoppolo to beat you through the air. Now, throughout the regular season, for the most part, he was able to do that, you know, with Debo Samuel and even, you know, with George Kittle earlier in the year. But in that particular game, he wasn't able to perform. He wasn't able to pull through and the Rams won that game. Then you look at the AFC championship and you saw the Bengals drop eight back in coverage twice as often in the second half as they did in the first half. And it ultimately confused Pat Mahomes to where he wasn't comfortable uh, with so many defenders having to, you know, sort of try and look them off, get a receiver open, lead them, you know, in a particular direction, whatever it might be. And the Bengals wound up winning that game. And then uh, the Chiefs only scored, you know, a few points in the second half. And I think it's partially why we're all saying that the Chiefs collapsed in the second half, uh, as opposed to the Bengals winning that game. But I do believe that the defensive game theory matters a good bit. If you're looking at an, at an NFL head coach and saying, okay, who has the most ability to adjust given a specific matchup? If something is not working, how easily can you transition to a plan B? If there is a way to quantify this, if there is a way to look at this without dealing with too small a sample size, but if you're able to figure out which coaches can best adjust and, and can use uh, key personnel to adjust offensively and defensively, if you're able to quantify that and use that in a situation where they can handle just about any matchup thrown their way or any wrinkle thrown their way on the other side of the ball, then I really think you have something. How you do that, I think, is a real challenge. But in conference championship weekend, we saw, to me, the two best coaches uh, you know, in those particular matchups be able to adjust a good bit more than their counterparts. And I think that's largely why we have the, ma the matchup that we do in a couple of weeks. Let's say you're you're starting off this process, trying to decide how we can quantify this. Are you starting with head coaches? Because like anecdotally, we know Raheem Morris is a smart defensive guy. Like we know that anecdotally, mm -hmm. are you looking to quantify it based on the coaching staff, defensive coordinators, head coaches? Where are you kind of starting that process? I know I'm putting you like on the spot here, but like, sure. what is your first step in trying to quantify that? I think actually, you know, do you start at head coaches or coordinators? I think it largely depends on who's calling the shots, if, sure. if that makes sense. Yeah. And so say, for instance, uh, you know, prior to Sean Payton retiring, if you're trying to rank uh, offensive flexibility. So, you know, when let's say when they had Drew Brees and there's a lot of short throws to Michael Thomas, for instance, if that's taken away from you in some way, shape or form, how easily can Sean Payton and Drew Brees adjust? So in that situation, you're starting with your head coach. but when it comes to, say, other teams, maybe the defensive coordinator is, is where you start as far as overall flexibility is concerned. I think part of it may simply be, okay, how much does a defense rely on single high versus two high? Uh, and is there ability to sort of look at that flexibility and determine, okay, what is the proportion of going in one direction versus another direction? And if you're looking at specific opponents, do they always go to that other direction and do they have success doing that? It, it is a complicated thing where, again, I'd always be mindful of not, you know, thinning off my uh, sample size to the point of absurdity. But I do think there's something there as far as looking at overall flexibility and, and starting with, OK, who are the real decision makers on a specific side of the ball? What have they shown, historically speaking, as far as flexibility? And then working your way from there to determine who has the overall flex. I know it's my yeah. key word here, but who has the overall flexibility uh, to be able to handle a variety of matchups. And that to me is how you do it. Tough sure. part here for me is that like, I tried to do this, this similar kind of approach with, with uh, thinking about the NFL this year. And I was like, okay, which teams have multiple ways to beat you? Mm -hmm. Like if you try to take away one thing, what's their counter punch. And that led me to betting the Dallas Cowboys to win the Super Bowl back in like week five. Whoops. Mm -hmm. Did not work out. <laughs> so like, I feel like it's like scar tissue there for me where I'm like, oh, I, I kind of did this and it didn't work out. But I do think that like having that flexibility is so important if it did lead me down a, a poor path in that specific instance. And it's funny you bring up specifically week five with the Cowboys because, because I before think, Zeke got hurt, the running game got bad. That, yeah, before the running game got bad. And also, too, I think especially when it comes to Kellen Moore over these last few years, the ceiling is super duper high as far as his play calling creativity, but boy, it does get stale at times. Yeah. Uh, you look at the, the game against Denver. I'm not sure what they were doing there. Even the game against the 49ers in the playoffs, th there was not the creativity that I would have expected in large part, because I 
did feel like that they were really forcing it to their key playmakers uh, instead of using, you know, the overall, you know, breadth and depth of that receiving core, which is actually quite deep. It's it's so fascinating when, you know, certain teams do kind of fall back on certain options, uh, you know, whether they, you know, whatever the reason is, ultimately they start doing it. And it's why, like, I always had a certain level of skepticism with the Cowboys, even though I loved watching that offense. I love Dak Prescott and what he can do. But also look at the other side of it. The Kansas City Chiefs, what was our biggest complaint about them all season long? Who are the tertiary receivers? Do you trust Byron Pringle in a key situation? Do you trust McCole Hardman? Um, you know, even Travis Kelsey was a little bit inconsistent for part of the season before he was able to step up, uh, you know, toward the tail end. And so, yeah, Pat Mahomes is a beast. That's fine. But, you know, do you trust the third and fourth option? And I think that was one of the big reasons why they lost the AFC championship game. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, you think about that in terms of the Packers, too, that are very top heavy in their receiving mm-hmm. core uh, as well. And they were pretty good until that last game where they they just <laughs> absolutely didn't show up after the first two drives. I did want to mention that, uh, you know, Dr. Eric Eager over at PFF has kind of looked at uh, predictability of defenses. So he was looking at whether uh, – when you face a strong rushing attack, whether that said anything about how predictable you are on defense, the idea being that you become more predictable because you're putting eight guys in the box and yada, yada, yada. He didn't find anything Mm -hmm. shocking. I know. Um, But, but I think some of the tools are there. So he has some of these kind of uh, information theory type tools to kind of look at. uh, I think they would be applicable to say, you know, how does this coordinator uh, have his schemes in the first half versus the second half? Those mm-hmm. types of things. I think those are their ways of looking at overlap. How how much do you change from game to game? Things like that. So we'll just send them over a copy of this podcast and uh, let them yeah. this so, season. Right. Have, have them be inspired by this. No, but I, I, you know, I wonder too, and, and this is always, this kind of goes back to one of my sort of hallmark ideas as far as, you know, how a game unfolds in general. And I think this is also important in terms of live betting. I wonder, had the Bengals only been down, say, seven, or three if they would not have been compelled to completely Mm -hmm. change up their defensive game plan in the second half and that would have ultimately led to their demise i genuinely believe that there are teams that need to be down significantly late in the first quarter (laughs) halftime whatever it is for them to do something completely different and it, it sounds counterintuitive but to me it makes sense where if you are down by a greater deficit you are likelier to do something completely different. And right. ultimately that's better for you than saying, you know what, we're only down three, we're only down seven. Let's just stick with what we're doing. And then we're likelier to win the game. No, I think that's that's right. the wrong way to approach it. I think if you do something completely different, then that may actually increase your overall win probability. And so bigger gaps, bigger deficits, I think in some strange way can be more beneficial for good teams. Yeah, that reminds me of Carolina and Ron Rivera, and when mm-hmm. his uh, his rear end was on the hot seat, then he started going for fourth downs. Do you <laughs> think that increases? That's when he became Riverboat Ron. Mm-hmm. He's never quite reached the same level since, especially with uh, the football team or or the Commanders. Are we calling them the Commanders now? Let's do it. I hated yeah. the football teams. So let's go Commanders. Oh, really? That sounds great. <laughs> like football team. It's just I so corny. Like, just call it Washington or the Commanders now. Let's just, just do WFT. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, WFT. <laughs> it's just kind of rolls off the tongue. If you guys but, remember a Homestar Runner and the Commandos, the Cheat Commandos, <laughs> I can't stop thinking about that. And I know it's just the most, like, director's deep cut pop culture reference but now i can't stop you know singing to myself commandos in the classroom and, and now you get that indefinitely you get that uh you yeah. get that for the rest of time so uh right. thank you washington for this true gift now you're talking about adaptability talking about you know the way they adapt during the championship game let's spin that forward to talking about super bowl 56 here between the rams and the bengals right now rams four and a half point favorites over at FanDuel sportsbook Total is 48 and a half. Let's talk about the Bengals offense here first, because we saw that game in the divisional round. Joe Burrow takes nine sacks and they win. Probably not sustainable to do that again. The problem is they're facing Von Miller, Aaron Donald. Not ideal. So do you think with two weeks to prepare, the Bengals offensive line can formulate a game plan to hold up or are they in deep doo-doo here? 
Can I say a little bit of both? Sure. Uh, in, yeah, in, in large part, because I think it's important that we look at pressures first instead of sacks and then sort of figure out where we need to go from here. If you look at, well, I'll backtrack for a little bit in terms of looking at uh, defensive line and pass rush win rate. Uh, you know, the good folks at ESPN, you know, really strong stuff there. Titans for this season were 21st in pass rush win rate. Kansas City was seventh. And so the Chiefs should have actually been better as far as taking Burrow to the ground uh, than the Titans were. Now, you go back to that divisional game, the Titans were only rushing four for the most part. Uh, they weren't blitzing that much. Uh, it was really, I would argue, secondary sacks that had Joe Burrow flummoxed. Kansas City really wasn't able to do that for the most part. And I think part of that in terms of you know the injuries in the secondary uh, certainly had something to do with that. But if, if the Titans were to have nine sacks, then Kansas City probably should have come pretty close to that. But if you look at quarterback pressures, basically when a defender's within a couple of yards of the quarterback, Kansas City was almost the same as far as the Titans were, as far as that was concerned. Titans had 15 pressures in that divisional game. Kansas City had 11. Joe Burrow was still, for the most part, either running for his life or having to, to ad lib or something of the sort. He was more successful doing that against Kansas City. Is it sustainable against L.A.? Probably not, but there's probably some sort of happy medium between the nine sacks that the Bengals gave up and just the one that they did against against Kansas City. To me, also, I think it because of L.A.'s reputation with Aaron Donald and company, I think this is a situation where Joe Burrow is going to, you know, even though he doesn't have a whole lot of rollout plays in that playbook, at least we haven't seen too many of them this season. I think this is going to be something where Burrow is going to try and do a little bit more from outside the pocket in large part because of defensive reputation. Mm -hmm. And I think for the most part, that should be a good bit more successful. Either that or shorter throws where defenders just don't have the time to create a pressure. But this is definitely a situation mm -hmm. where, you know, nine sacks I don't think is going to happen. But if Burrow is staying in the pocket too long, then I do think L.A. can come close to it. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I didn't. I, I would not have guessed that the 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 sack to hurry was so uh, close. Or I mean, they were basically the same in the Tennessee game, um, and then that. What I mean, he only took one sack against Kansas City, right? Or yeah, one one sack. And if you look at uh, pressure rate, it was a uh, thirty three percent or pressure rate mm -hmm. for dropbacks, uh, thirty three percent for Tennessee, twenty eight percent for Kansas City. So it wasn't that different. Yeah, it wasn't that different. I mean, he certainly had two plays in the second half where he was able to escape and and run for some yards. Uh, I'm pretty sure at least one of those was a pretty critical conversion mm -hmm. on those drives. Definitely um, uh, helped with that comeback. So, uh, yeah, any, any thoughts? We uh, we have Rams minus four and a half at most sports books now. Total of 48 and a half. Any, any, uh, any, any bets for you on this? So as far as the side is concerned, I, I still want to wait a little bit. And I, I know, uh, you know, when it was three and a half, I think it was an obvious Ram side and then you're done there. Uh, but now it's at four and a half. I'm probably going to wait a little bit if for some reason it gets to five. And I don't think it will. But if for any reason it gets to five, then I think I'm probably going to lean Bengals there because th this is, you know, a relatively lopsided line as far as a Super Bowl is concerned. And I, I don't know how much stock or pe people are giving into, say, the Rams home field advantage. I actually do think you should give a little, a little stock to it. Uh, but also, too, you know, the Bengals, yeah, they are a little bit fortunate to be, you know, in this particular spot. But the Rams, you know, those games are fairly close as well. Um, I don't necessarily think that, uh, you know, the Rams are, you know, drastically better. I think that's in large part because – we look at our priors at the start of the season and the Rams were way better than the Bengals. Zach Taylor was on the hot seat <laughs> as far as uh, keeping his job. Joe Burrow was coming off of an injury and, you know, could he be comeback player of the year? You know, what's he going to do without a great offensive line? The Bengals had a ton of questions coming into the season yeah. and now they're in the Super Bowl, whereas the Rams made enormous investments and you expected them, even if they weren't going to win the NFC West because the Cardinals were on fire, at least they were going to make the playoffs and probably cause a lot of trouble for whichever teams they were facing. So are you willing to abandon your priors and admit that the Bengals are a really good football team or you know, is the volatility in an AFC that we could not discern to save our lives? That's why they're in the Super Bowl. 
So I, I understand the rationale there. I'm going to wait uh, just to see if this line does anything. Uh, if it gets to four, then I'll be really upset. Uh, but right now, I think if if it gets to five for any reason, then I'm siding with the Bengals. Uh, but, you know, until that happens, then I'm just going to hang tight. I was looking at my preseason rankings this week, and uh, Cincinnati was the fifth worst team. Mm-hmm. And and remember, this is you know this is this is a big reason why my numbers are are pretty good throughout the year. I, I really trust my preseason prior. So, uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about home field. Uh, sure. My understanding is that the Super Bowl is a very corporate affair. Uh, there's you know even though Tampa Bay kind of had a home field advantage, I didn't really give them much of anything last. Well, that was a different situation with COVID as well and the restricted right. tickets. Um, it wasn't I, I a full like, stadium. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a full stadium. I feel with this, you know, you know, there's this kind of idea that the Rams don't have any fans down there. You could see all the red that was uh, at the NFC conference championship, NFC championship game last week. So what, what, what's, uh, I mean, why do you think there's going to be, do you just think there's going to be some extra Rams fans simply due to the proximity? Perhaps, uh, you know, I wonder too, in terms of, uh, you know, physical, you know, biological components in terms of the Rams not having to go anywhere, whereas the Bengals are having to travel. I wonder if there's something to that. Uh, I think also too, yeah, the, the Super Bowl can be a little bit corporate, but I think also too, familiarity helps a little bit. I, I believe the Rams are going to be using their own locker room, even yeah, though yeah. they are technically the road team mm-hmm. uh, in this matchup. I, I think those things, you know, may have, you know, the slightest uh, advantage there. I mean, it's it's not a, a major one, but I do believe that when all the settings are relatively the same and everything is very much familiar, you know, how much does officiating matter in terms of, you know, being at the Rams home ballpark? I, I, I feel like eventually these things add up to where ultimately it becomes pretty close to a home field advantage of roughly two, two and a half. And there, there's really nothing that leads me to believe that the Bengals are going to, you know, do something really out of the ordinary in terms of having a lot of additional fans there or, you know, some sort of inspiring pregame speech that's all of a sudden going to make them, uh, you know, nullify the home field advantage. I, I do think it is fair to, to keep something in there. Is it, the, you know, it's certainly not three. I mean, that's silly. But is it something where it is close to around two? I, I think there are enough things that you can point to to say yes. Interesting. Yeah, I think that uh, it's something I've thought about. I haven't arrived at a proper conclusion yet. I have nothing in there right now because the Bengals start traveling so far ahead of time. Because that's the main reason I have home field in there now is not fans, but because of travel. Mm-hmm. Whereas that's not a factor here because they're traveling so far ahead of time. But like, sure. I don't, I don't know the right answer. I, like, I have no idea. But Edward, we had you on in the summer to talk about like weird props uh, for uh, the Euro twenty twenty. <laughs> kind of want to talk to you about the Super Bowl too, because we got some weird props to Super Bowl. We can do some traditional props too if you want. Yeah, uh, the king of the non-traditional markets here. Where are you seeing uh, some fun ones you like here for Super Bowl Fifty Six? So I'm looking at the tight end position and, and trying to sort of discern what's going to happen there because it looks like CJ Uzama, uh, you know, will play in this game, which is is great for the Bengals. And uh, you know, how, how much do you really put stock in a tight end who, you know, doesn't have just a ton of receiving yards um, at, at the same time, in terms of the game plan that I think the Bengals need to have to win that game. I feel like he is a critical piece. So that, you know, sort of splitting the difference as far as what I would normally adjust for with a starting tight end versus uh, how impactful he should be in terms of potential. Uh, but anytime touchdown scores for the tight ends, that's, that's where I'm beginning uh, my overall prop search process. Uh, Uzama, anytime touchdown score, that's going to be interesting. But if for some reason, you know, he's limited in any way, shape or form, Drew Sample is the backup. And so I think there's some value in terms of looking at him. And then you look at the LA side and Tyler Higby is very much a question mark as far as playing this game at all. And so now you're going to Kendall Blanton and Bryson Hopkins. Bryson Hopkins I, I, I don't, I, he may have like one catch all season. He was an active last week. Yeah. yeah. He was an active last week. And so if he plays, then that would make perfect sense as far as the Rams doing something really, really kooky 
And having someone catch a touchdown who's done just about nothing all season long makes for a great feel good story, all that good stuff. And you're getting some great value as far as an anytime touchdown is concerned with him. Kendall Blanton also, too, if you don't just trust Hopkins in that spot, I think that matters as well. And then another one that I, I will talk about uh, on the show, uh, more ways to win on the ah. FanDuel platforms. Ah. Ah, yeah. Hey, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Joe Burrow over 10 and a half rushing yards is one that I really, really love. Because again, I do feel like that rollouts are going to be the way to nullify this great Rams defense. And I wouldn't be surprised if instead of a rollout, Burrow just takes off. It wouldn't be that much to get to 10 and a half to me. Well, and two, like we saw him do that against Chiefs, like you alluded to that Chris Jones mm-hmm. rush where he was under pressure, ran away from that. And Burrow, when he was in college, ran a bit more, uh, especially mm-hmm. in like the higher leverage games. Not as much since his knee injury, but like if you're going to run, probably going to be here. And he's probably not going to be super comfortable in that pocket right now, uh, given where things go. The good thing with you're talking about the, the tight end stuff, you can bet CJ Uzama now. If he's an active I bet it's refunded. Like that, that's the way things work over at FanDuel. So um, I think that's a luxury. If you want to bet on Higby or Uzama, Uzama is plus 360 for any time touchdown. Like that is a safety valve you have uh, mm-hmm. with these, with these player props and stuff like that. So I think that that definitely does help as well. Well, yeah, okay. definitely. And I, okay. I wanted to look something up real fast as I, as yeah. I try and talk slowly, because uh, you were talking about Joe Burrow rushing in college. Yeah. So the one game that Joe Burrow had uh, at LSU when he won the national championship, that was the, the biggest question mark was at home against Auburn. Auburn had a phenomenal defense that year and LSU still hung 23. Burrow's 13 carries for 31 yards in that game. Now, granted, uh, I'm with you that LSU wanted to run Joe Burrow a little bit more, but when your defense is playing that well, which, you know, the Rams obviously have, you know, a great front and a great interior. Is that a situation where Joe Burrow will be required to run a good bit more? We've seen him do it in college. I do believe that they have the offensive flexibility to have things in there for him to take off on the outsides. 31 yards in that game. I think he can easily hit over 10 and a half this game. Yeah, I think he definitely could too. I think it's a, a good way to look at it. Like in general, quarterbacks run more in high leverage games when they are capable mm-hmm. and Burrow is capable. High leverage game doesn't get any more high leverage than this one. <laughs> the others who want to have you on here today, Edward, is talk some men's college basketball because we have not done that yet. We're going to have a full show next week on props for Super Bowl too. So we'll have plenty more discussion around that then. But I want to talk to you about men's college basketball because I've been checked out. It is already February, and that's scary if we're trying to get set for March as these seasons wind down. So I want to ask you, what have been your key takeaways from the first few months of the men's college basketball season this year? Isn't it amazing how we add a week to the NFL season and all of a sudden that affects our college basketball? I'm behind on everything. Like NASCAR starts Sunday, and I would like got sent like – like I'm trying to like scramble to do a DFS podcast on Friday. I'm like, I forgot that I had to do this and it's, it's Wednesday and I'm very behind. <laughs> Let, let's keep this about you, Jim. Yeah, yes, let's, exactly. Let's keep Thank your you. I appreciate about you. Thank that's, you for that's thinking really about me. We, yes. That's, that's why we listen to covering the spread is, <laughs> that's right. is for, for Jim Sonis. Uh, Jim complaining about NASCAR scheduling is why people tune in. Leave yeah, those yeah. ratings and reviews right now. That, that's, that's the headline for this episode, yes. right? <laughs> uh and the game and the race at the coliseum too so yeah exactly uh no as far as college basketball is concerned uh what are my takeaways well first of all it's funny that yes we have just turned the calendar page to february and i still feel like strength of schedule doesn't get talked enough i feel like that there is this reputation in college basketball that there's some point in january and february to where we know what we have because Everyone has played enough games to where there are enough data points where we can feel comfortable as far as ranking our teams, determining who has a good offense, who has good paces, things like that. And the truth is, I don't think we have that yet. I still feel like that we are doing a little bit of guesswork as far as not not necessarily the best teams in the country and who they are, but who are legitimate contenders. I look at LSU as an obvious example here. Look at LSU's schedule year after year after year. It's not usually a team that's that's making a lot of in-season tournaments or or a team that's facing, you know, the absolute best competition, you know, non-conference game after non-conference game. They were off to a phenomenal start and now they're what, 1 and 5 in their last 6 games. They, they've they've been exposed and I think that we can conclude. And there are other teams like that who have 
gotten off to these incredibly hot starts or these slow starts, but because of what happens in conference play, all of a sudden we realize who they really are. And so, you know, LSU is one example where finally they get to SEC play and they're not as strong as we thought they were. I mean, they lost to Ole Miss, uh, you know, on Tuesday night. So I think that's significant. At the same time, look at a team like Auburn. And that's a team that, yeah, they're, they're off to this incredibly dynamite start. And the one loss was very, very close. But I still have some questions about them. I, I'm not exactly sure how much I, I trust them sort of, you know, in general. They haven't, been, they haven't uh, broken a sweat very much in conference play. Fine. The block rate is great. So the highlight reel is uh, truly spectacular with Auburn. But they're not a great jump shooting team. And eventually, you need to have your offense manufacture points in a variety of ways for me to feel comfortable having them far in the tournament. And yeah, Auburn's got a great front line. And I am splitting hairs here. Like, is Auburn a top 10 team? Yeah, they are. But are they the best team in the country? Are they my pick to win the national championship with the second lowest odds? No, there's no value there at all. If, if you w really liked Auburn, you should have bet them a long time ago. All the value is gone as far as that's concerned. So I'm still looking at the Tigers a little suspiciously, as perhaps I am for the majority of the SEC, with maybe the exception of Kentucky. I still feel like Kentucky has room for growth. But on the other hand, as, as far as uh, you know, what, what else we've learned from this college basketball season, the Big 12 is still absolutely legitimate. Uh, Baylor is still a very good team that I would argue is probably playing better defense this season than the national championship season. Yeah, they lost a lot of offensive playmakers, but Baylor is still a scary team to me. Kansas still looks very good. Depth is a bit of a concern, but I like them a lot. And Texas Tech is another one uh, that I think can make a deep run in this tournament. This could very well be the year where the Big 12, yeah, they've always had a team that that's made a run or, you know, gotten a lot of headlines, Kansas for several years, Baylor winning the championship, Texas Tech making it to the final. This may be a year where the Big 12 does even more in the NCAA tournament because there are so many contenders. So we're skeptical here of Auburn, despite the fact that they are minus 1500 to win the SEC, which, you know, is very different than talking about them long term. Any right. value for you in the futures market anywhere, Edward, uh, or are we staying away from that right now? Yeah. So it, as far as the futures are concerned, I, I do feel like the Texas Tech has a real good shot at winning the Big 12. Obviously, some big wins on their ledger. The questionable loss or two, I think, is largely in part because of scheduling, because they've had some pretty grueling road trips. But also, too, the health was a real concern at the start of January. I think they're starting to get a little bit healthier. They always had a great defense, no matter who was out there on the floor. Credit coaching there. I think that matters a good bit. I think Texas Tech can make a real run uh, in terms of winning the conference. Another conference winner I like a lot is Illinois out of the Big Ten. Big game against Michigan State. Obvious play in terms of, you know, prepping for that game was to slow down Trent Frazier because, you know, he's the guy who was in that contest. But Illinois has some real depth that I don't think gets discussed enough. I know Illinois was a disappointment last year in terms of an early out in the NCAA tournament, but you cannot read too much into that. And I still feel like that there is a small contingent of the betting public that still does and doesn't look at Illinois uh, like we thought of them as being, you know, one of the dynamite front runners who won the national championship last year. I do feel like Illinois with that top 40 effective field goal percentage offensively, top 10 offensive rebounding rate, that they can win the Big Ten and make a, se a serious run. Yeah, uh, Texas Tech right now, plus 440 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Illinois, plus 240 over in the Big Ten. You can check those out right now. You can check out Edward Egros on More Ways to Win. You can check him out, Valley Sports, NBC Sports Edge, and check him out on Twitter at Ed with Sports. Ed, we appreciate the time. Good luck to you with your Super Bowl bets. Are you? Go I'm assuming you're not going, right? Uh, uh, we're figuring things out. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. TBA. It's a possibility. It's a TBA. possibility. Yeah, like it's, a, it. it's, it's a TBA. Yeah. I like yeah. it. We'll take the TBA. If you do yeah. go, uh, good luck in the traffic. Have fun. Uh, enjoy that. Uh, but enjoy the game, and we'll talk to you again oh, soon. Got, he can take the transit in LA, right? Uh, the, the the metro is available, but I would still have to wake up extra extra early and do a lot of hiking and things like. I mean, how long would it take for me to walk from the valley to SoFi? That's the question. I, I only know like the valley because through. of Pulp Fiction. I have no idea where it actually is. Yeah, and the lion's share of the uh, listening public here wouldn't. But uh, <laughs> that, that's a very L.A. thing to say. Like, how long would it take me to, to walk through the Santa Monica Mountains? We'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck. Either way, we appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.
covering the future. Big thank you once again to Edward Egros for swinging by and breaking down his thoughts on Super Bowl 56. We talked men's college basketball. Tried to see if he would talk uh, Olympics, Winter Olympics before the show, <laughs> but unfortunately, no, no stuff there for Edward. I've got nothing, obviously, but uh, tried to squeeze it out of him. And I, like I asked that half expecting him to say here, I've got simulations run for bobsledding, right. figure skating and everything else, because kind of right. what Edward E. Gross does. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And and he's been writing uh, Seven Nuggets Saturday for the, for the newsletter at the Power Rank, and it's actually been, I mean, there, there's more opens on that than, than some of the stuff that I, I just write. And it's been really awesome. Um, just, just, you know, I wanted to engage him on that project so that I could just learn about more stuff that he's doing. Right. So for example, um, there was some, this is before I ever started playing Wordle, but he actually had like two or three links to Wordle analytics. Okay. So this was like a couple of weeks ago. So it's probably yeah. way out of date and someone's done something better <laughs> by now. Um, but he's also been doing a bunch of college basketball stuff. I think for NBC sports, I think they're having him write like a weekly thing on college basketball. So he's been digging into that and you know, they're now, um, in last week's seven nuggets, he pulled out, uh, there's this guy, Evan Maya, who seems like a young, young student that actually, I don't even know if he's a student, but whatever, he's doing some Bayesian methods to figure out the contribution of a player yeah. on offense and defense in college basketball, which is not easy. I mean, it's not, you know, I mean, in the NBA, like you can't just look at like raw plus minus because mm -hmm. it's just very noisy. You need seasons upon seasons of data yeah. to get some some insight out of that. But um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, a wealth of knowledge there. And I've been benefiting um, by working with him on on some stuff at the Power Rank. And uh, yeah, you can check it out, too, uh, at the Power dot com. All right. So Seven Nuggets Saturday comes out every Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Yeah. And we just confirm that we're gonna keep doing it the entire year so oh okay i like that so you can benefit from edward's wide 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 net of knowledge as well uh seven nuggets saturday get that over the power .com. let's talk now about super bowl 56 ed let's hear what your numbers are saying here about rams versus Bengals next week yeah the more i was talking about rams at uh, Rams against San Francisco last week, uh, the more I think we're kind of seeing something a little bit similar. So I think the thing to remember here is that pass offense is the most predictable part of uh, the NFL. So when you look at, you know, passing success rate from early part of the season to the later part of the season, that's the stickiest thing that I've found, period. It's it's more than like even uh, passing EPA per drop back. It's more than certainly things like rushing, um, any kind of rushing stat that I found and not on defense, but on offense in particular. And that's in particular why, why I just thought the Rams would get it done last week against the Niners, as I already talked about. And that's again, why I think the, the, that's why, again, why I'm leaning towards the Rams um, here in this game. So they, uh, you know, the Rams are the second best uh, offense. When I look at adjusted success rate, we know they're very good. And they're just better than the Bengals on offense. I mean, the Bengals are ranked 11th when I look at adjusted success rate. We know that they have uh, a high upside with Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. And, and that's just maybe the most promising young core in the NFL. But, you know, they're 11th because Burrow does take a lot of sacks. I mean, he didn't against Kansas City, but throughout the course of the season, his sack rate has been, been really bad. And a sack is, by definition, an unsuccessful play. And... Again, passing success rate tends to be sticky. The Rams are just better at it. And I think both of these defenses are essentially league average. Uh, Cincinnati is almost exactly at league average. The Rams started the season, started the postseason below league average and then had two pretty good performances. And so now they're up to 11th. But I'm not exactly going to say that uh, they're in the same category as the Bills. And I, and I just think when you think about this game, it's you're better off thinking that the Rams are going to continue to throw the ball well than to think that Cincinnati's average defense is going to come out and play like they did in the second half against Kansas City and shut down a really good offense. Could it happen? Of course. Of course it could happen. Um, but defense just doesn't tend to be as predictable. And um, my numbers like the Rams by five. Uh, I was flipping around during a, um, a slow moment during the NFC Championship game, and, and Spanky was like, if you want to get closing line value on the Super Bowl, you better bet it as soon as this game is over. So I took the words to heart. 
Uh, I got Rams minus three and a half. It's it's not it's not getting back to three and a half. No. <laughs> so um, I like the Rams. I think they're going to win. I think they can actually run away with it if 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 Burrow uh, and company don't come to play. But um, but yeah, I, I like where I stand with that. Yeah. So regarding the stickiness discussion, I actually have like my the compare the correlation in my preseason priors and the actual data for teams this year on like different efficiency numbers. And it's not success rate, but like looking at their EPA numbers, the mm-hmm. highest correlation was overall offense, second highest correlation passing offense, third highest correlation rushing offense. Then you get to the first defense and metric that right. is that was next up. It was overall defense, then pass defense, then rush defense. And there's a pretty big gap between the offensive stickiness versus the defensive. Either that or my defensive numbers just sucked. You choose. Uh, but like that, the numbers back up what you're saying, uh, where it's easier to predict offense performance. And like with the Rams talking about their passing offense, their passing offense is good. Even when you ca- account for Matthew Stafford's like back breaking interceptions, even when you include those, the most negative interpretation of those, which is EPA, EPA does not do as good of a job of canceling those out as success rate does. Even if you look at the most negative interpretation of him and what he does it still views this team as being a very good passing offense. Right. And I think that yeah. that's important to note that like, sure. He do- makes, he does some dumb stuff, but overall they're very, very good. Even when you account for that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they, he had the pick sixes in three straight games and then he had another one against the Ravens. Part of the, part of what I looked up in, in writing up this game on the site, but you know, those plays are kind of fluky, right? Yeah. I was sitting uh, during the San Francisco Green Bay game with some friends and they're like, yeah, Jimmy Garoppolo is going to throw a pick six. And I was like, dude, I'll give you guys 21 odds that, they, that he does. <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, I'll take that. And my other friend's like, well, I don't want you to be in the hole 40 bucks. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm good, buddy. It's all right. <laughs> so he took it too. And this is Jimmy Garoppolo, right? I mean, we right. all saw how he was trying to give the ball away yeah. uh, in that game. And and a lot of things have to go right for an interception to go back for a touchdown. And it's just unlikely to happen. So, um, yeah, you know, and that's part of the reason, like, I mean, even with it, you said it didn't really affect Stafford's EPA stuff as much. I think that's, you know, that's good in the sense that, like, you know, EPA can be a little more trustworthy there. But you know, that's an unsuccessful play, right? Yeah. When I look at success rate. And, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I don't have any reason to think that. I mean, of course, I mean, you know, Stafford could have a terrible game and Burrow could have a good game. Yeah, it could happen. But I don't think that's the more likely scenario. So your numbers have Rams minus five. Mine have Rams minus 4.2. So I am staying away from the total or the spread in this game. And looking at the prop market, we'll talk again about props next week on the live stream, 6 p.m. Uh, on Wednesday. But... I'm going to go towards the prop market here as well. And typically my favorite props are yardage props because with those, you have multiple paths to winning. You get there via volume or you get there via a couple of big plays. But for Super Bowl 56, I think my favorite prop is actually a touchdown prop. And that is Joe Mixon to score a plus 115 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. I'm going to go here because of Mixon's immense role inside the red zone. Mixon has played 18 full games this year between the, the postseason and regular season. In those 18 games, he has 44% of the team's red zone carries or targets. That is like an upper echelon type number. I think Derek Henry is at like 48 or 47% when he was healthy this year for the Titans. So like Mixon gets a lot of work in close. It led to 17 total touchdowns. Uh, He had at least one touchdown in 11 out of 18 full games. He did have a touchdown in like a, what I deem to be a non-full game. So just toss that one out. Uh, So 12 out of 19 total, but 11 of 18 in the games that I cared about which 61% of the games he played in. So typically guys with Nixon's red zone role hover from like minus 130 to minus 110, the end of time touchdown market. Nixon's at plus 115. Part of that is game situation because the Bengals team total is 21 and a half. So fewer touchdowns than you would expect if they were seven point favorites versus the Browns or something, you know, weird like that. But he has longer odds than Jamar Chase, and I don't think he really should right now. In the playoffs, Mixon has averaged 17.3 carries, five targets per game. He's getting tons of chances, and plenty of those have been close to the goal line. I did look at his rushing plus receiving prop. That is typically my favorite market, but it is at 95 and a half. 
for context, he was at 83 and a half in that market or 81 and a half, like two games ago. He's it's too high. Like I, I'm not going to take an under yet, but like, I'm thinking about it. Uh, it's too high of a number. Cam Akers under will probably come up on the show next Wednesday. But I think that my favorite way to get exposure to Mixon's really good role is taking his anytime touchdown market at plus 114 and to take advantage of what is a very good role for Joe Mixon. And when I was looking at the numbers, uh, the the prop markets over at FanDuel, I feel like when we talk next week, I'm going to be very boring because every like yardage prop that I like is an under. It was similar to last week too. Sure. And like, I typically, like people talk about, you know, oh, you should always bet unders because like things can happen. I do go with a lot of overs, but like the past two weeks, they've juiced things up so much that I think... I think we just got to go a lot of unders as boring as it may be. I think that's the way to go for next week. Hey, boring makes money. So, yeah. uh, yeah. So I wanted to talk again about the Mixon thing, right? Because yeah. we saw Samaji Piran a bunch of times in that game. Third it down. Like was, yep. It looks like he was getting, you know, a lot of the passing situations. So, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like, are you not ready to pull the trigger on like passing in rushing yards under 95? That sounds like a, I don't know. I'm not. He's at 98.8 for his average. Yeah, it is a lot. Um, What's the average over the year? I can't. 98.8. 98.8. Oh, has it? Average. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think Acres under 83 and a half is great. Like I would take that right now. Uh, because right. his role is very shaky. Based on even before he got hurt last week, it was very shaky. And like Sony Michelle is coming in for pass blocking and stuff like that. Like I'll take an Acres under. I would not take Nixon yet. But I, I can't go the over. I know that for sure. Because he's at 98.8 for, I think, for full games this year. He's at, at that number. So okay. I think that one's appropriate, but I'm definitely not going over. I could see an under there. Acres, I would take the under now, honestly, at 83.5. Right. With with the role that he has, that's way too high of a number. I just I don't know why it's up there. But okay. I think that that's kind of where I'm viewing things for right now. Piran was in there, but it was mostly third downs. Nixon's role is still pretty good. Uh, so right. I think that being high on him I, is still the wise way to go. But if Piran's getting in there, that that's just maybe one, two receptions that Nixon doesn't have that puts him Correct. under, you know, one, two chances that he doesn't have of breaking a 30 yard. At 95 and, and a half, that matters a lot. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's something to keep in mind. I think that that will be relevant for acres. And I think we'll be talking a lot of unders next week. And that is next week, Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern on the FanDuel YouTube page and up on the uh, Covering the Spread podcast feed after that. Should be a lot of fun. Me, Ed, and JJ, and a fourth guest to be announced later will be a blast then. So we'll talk to all of you then. But first, a big thank you once again to Edward Egros for singing by and breaking down his thoughts on Super Bowl 56 and some men's college basketball. Find Edward on Twitter at Edward Sports and check him out on More Ways to Win this week and next week to get you set for the Super Bowl as well. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? Yeah, I'm writing my free email newsletter. Uh, it has Seven Nuggets Saturday, which will have some props and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, it's actually, I guess, our first nugget list of nuggets without a game. So that'll be kind of interesting. Um, but I think we can do it. I think we can do a good job with this one. I have faith. Maybe even a world thing in there. You never know. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, you can check that out at thepowerrank.com. And we're sitting here on Wednesday and I'm about to talk to Colin Davey. He's, oh, yeah. uh, he's doing some really interesting things with uh, a Betsco project, which is uh, a way of, uh, I guess, kind of betting your hunches. So if you think something's going to happen in an NBA game, um, he, his tool gives you a way of looking at a wide array of possible bets that, that may interest you. So check that out at the Football Analytics Show. Um, that'll be up later this week yeah uh i am signed up for colin's newsletter too uh for the website uh it's been helpful so far i got the first one that i after i had signed up this week so uh check out ed stuff at the powerrank.com and check out the interview with colin later on at the football analytics show and check out ed on twitter at the power rank i'm at jim sonnes j-i-m-s-a-n-n-e-s -N -N -E you can also follow the fanduel podcast network at fanduel podcast big thank you to everyone for tuning in for this week we'll talk to you once again next week for our prop show live wednesday at 6 p.m we'll talk to you then this has been covering the spread right here on the fanduel podcast network what's up guys this is jordan spieth if you're watching this video Please like and subscribe to the FanDuel YouTube channel.